Hi, my name is Melvin Wei. Welcome to my YouTube channel. This is day zero of a new plant growing series entitled Growing Pomegranate Trees from Seeds. You can look for my name at any time on YouTube. That's Melvin Wei, W-E-I, to find my channel and my videos. So I have before you a beautiful red pomegranate from Palm Brand. And it's grown in California, USA, which is a great omen because I live in San Diego, California. So hopefully, if I get seedlings, they'll grow very easily in this climate when I eventually move them outside. But it's in the middle of winter, so I'm going to start indoors. So the hard red peel that you see is the pericarp. And the white slash yellowish spongy stuff you see inside is a mesocarp. All these red jewels, as people call them, are arrows or outgrowths from the epidermal cells on the seeds that are attached to the mesocarp. So you'll need to pry these away one by one. Or you can be more ambitious and try to pry away several at a time. Either way, you're going to see how much of a mess you make when you eat things like this. Normally with other fruits such as apples or oranges, the residue left behind is inconsequential. But for pomegranate, eating it sprays this red juice on everything you'll see drops on the backsplash the counter the oven top later on uh, the floor maybe even on your clothes uh, definitely on your forearms so it's a really messy fruit to eat but other fruits are messy as well it's just that you don't see the residue left behind because it's usually clear so as you can see it's quite an effort to eat one of these it takes a very long time you could easily be sitting in front of your a table or standing over a countertop for 20 minutes or more just trying to eat these but it's very enjoyable at the same time regarding pomegranate consumption I did everything out of order in the past first I drank the juice then I drank the smoothies and finally years later I got to see the fruit and enjoy it for the first time it's very rewarding although it takes a lot of work to eat and I edited out some of the footage of just me chewing off camera to save time so if you don't chew on them for a very long time you'll see that they're covered in red pulp so this cup in a ziploc bag was stored overnight just at room temperature I was eating that fruit very late at night and I didn't want to get into the filming of everything but here we are perhaps 10 or 12 hours later the next day and here's a seed that I cleaned it takes a lot of effort to clean one of these things so when you're eating the seeds, if you want to keep the seeds for germination, definitely don't clamp down with your molars, otherwise you'll just crush the developing embryos inside. So you're going to want to rub these between two folds of paper towels, and then use your bare fingernails to scrape off all of the fruit flesh. It's very fibrous, and this is very, very time-consuming. Sort of reminds me of my growing lemon trees from seed series start, where I had to sort of snip off the tops um, where the seeds were pointy and then do all this peeling it just takes forever and ever but eventually I did get 10 seeds I'm not going to handle this three or four hundred seeds in the cup it simply isn't worth the time investment to do many more than this because if I have the wrong germinating conditions it's going to be wrong for one seed or 350 since I'm treating them all the same so there's no real point and I don't feel like carrying out uh, way too many conditions in some kind of grand experiment. So here I have 10 seeds that have been cleaned meticulously. I put them in a clean cup and I'm going to sterilize by soaking them, spraying them with some 3% hydrogen peroxide in this spray bottle. 3% is a very safe concentration. It's used to treat skin wounds and whatnot and it's also used in contact lens cleaning solutions. So uh, just think about that before uh, I know some people are eventually going to spout off on how it's toxic and dangerous. It's, it's not. So they're floating. The hydrogen peroxide is generating a lot of oxygen. And there might be some fruit pulp and juice. That's why I did that. But the hydrogen peroxide won't hold that at bay forever. The mold growth will eventually come if there's a lot of fruit pulp. So this is a Chinese takeout plastic container. It was free, I didn't know what to do with it. I'm shaking a mixture. Maybe 70 to 80 percent sand that I bought from a store and 20 to 30 percent California wild hill dirt. It's a clay soil that's normally reddish in color. 
So I have a very loose mixture that should drain very well. I didn't want to use full soil or potting mix or something that could be very favorable for mold growth. So I'm shoving these seeds inside while everything's dry. Although I do know that when I spray some hydrogen peroxide for wetting purposes, to get these to germinate, the soil will be disturbed and gas will be generated, oxygen. So some of those seeds are going to tumble up to the top. They're just going to float in the chaos. Perhaps I should have wet the sand beforehand, but I always have this internal debate as to how much I should wet the sand soil mixture and whatnot. So I always end up doing things out of order. It is what it is. I just shove these back in with my fingertip to about one centimeter to maybe half an inch deep. I know I just mixed up units there, but um, yeah, just half an inch or maybe past one centimeter, one and a half centimeters deep. That's fine. And get on some plastic wrap to seal in the moisture because I really didn't spray that much. I didn't want to soak it all the way deep, all the way to the bottom because I don't know how much moisture is good. So it's day 13 and it turns out that that was an appropriate level of moisture actually. So you can see the moisture kind of um, spread out throughout the sand. And I have germination. So that was a very great sight to see. I have maybe four seedlings, although the one on the edge looks problematic. It looks like one of those seeds that just can't handle itself and it's going uh, belly up. But there's one closer to the edge on the left side that's sort of covered in sand and soil mixture. I expect everything to peel off. Now, this is actually not a bad species. There are some other things like, remember my very first honeydew series, the seeds would just uh, not do what they were supposed to do. Granted, I wasn't growing things the right way anyway, but I don't know how much of this condensation you see on the, the edge through the transparent plastic is soaked all the way to the core of the cylinder of dirt and sand. It could be that the moisture just tends to uh, travel along the edges of this plastic container. So I'm not sure how much more should I water or if I have enough there. So it's day 14 and I already noticed that there's phototropism exhibited by these little guys towards the blue lights on that cable modem right behind it which is quite incredible. That's a very small amount of blue light. Uh, plants like uh, blue and red light the most. That's what they use, the wavelengths that they use in the color spectrum. So everything's tilting over there. So I'm thinking I got to get this thing out of here and into my closet where I have this overhead LED panel with much, much brighter blue and red lights to facilitate growth. And these leaves are coming out and they have a a very weird kind of like tulip um, curl to them. So they're still waiting to unfurl. I imagine these are the cotyledons and that one seed like I said um, just doesn't know how to handle itself. I'm not going to bother writing everything. We've got enough seeds in there that are successful already. So it's day 15. I put the container in my closet under this LED panel like I said. Um, it's quite mesmerizing although you don't want to look at that kind of stuff directly. I recommend wearing sunglasses if you're going to deal with a lot of these growing lights. Uh, blue light from monitors and other electronics such as LEDs especially uh, can be dangerous as well as red lights as well. So don't stare at that stuff. So that's a temperature hygrometer uh, combo thingy that's uh, got tracking stats and all that. So I took off the plastic wrap and it seems like these are doing well enough but since I took off the plastic wrap everything's going to start drying so maybe I should start spray watering but I know the act of watering will also disturb things so there's a good chance that by watering I'll disturb these things and then they'll be crooked or fall over from the weight of big water droplets all over the leaves and the stems but at some point I'm going to have to do it anyway. But in the meantime we're getting more seedlings and 
The germination rate is so far quite good considering we only started with 10 seeds and you see five here. I think we already lost one on the side. It dried out because it went belly up and its root got exposed. So you can't save them all unless you want to micromanage each and every one. So it's day 17. It's looking very dry without the plastic wrap now. Water didn't get down deep the first time from my hydrogen peroxide spray. So after the hydrogen peroxide reacts, it's just basically released oxygen, which is quickly gone, which may help out the roots and also water. It turns into water, so um, it's not that much different after a few days than just having sprayed with um, deionized or distilled water, rainwater, or any kind of very pure water. So I'm just going to use distilled water in a spray bottle and see how this first spraying goes even though those droplets on the sides won't really contribute to the root systems at least they increase the overall humidity which is in and of itself sort of a currency for plants because when it's very humid even though there's no rainfall out in the desert for example um, at least the plants won't face all that uh, brutal evaporation in this kind of California desert climate in most of the state. So it's day 21. The first set of true leaves are coming in. The starter leaves were cotyledons. So unlike some plants where they just start growing true leaves immediately and have these microscopic or unnoticeable cotyledons, um, these have a very uh, typical growth pattern. I don't like how that one in the center is all crooked. Uh, Hopefully everything will straighten out because I have this directly under the LED growing panel. And since there's phototropism, especially early on, everything should write itself to grow straight up. Although as you can see right now, I'm spraying a lot of droplets and that adds a lot of weight. And if they're not well anchored, they could tip over, which is uh, always pretty annoying. So... Definitely this is a problem as I no longer have the plastic wrap on But I think in due time probably in a few days these will be taller than the top of the container So I'm gonna have to take some time to write these never know if they're gonna recover. It's always pretty precarious of a situation But this one doesn't seem like it's uh, poorly anchored to the point where it's not gonna be salvageable I really don't have the means to dig around in there and write everything um, especially because they're all so delicate and small right now and there's no room to really shuffle things around so it's day 26 and I'm using imidacloprid treatment I believe Bayer was the first company to come up with this insecticide it's the most widely used insecticidal compound in the world actually because it's very effective and I haven't started using it until very recently it's definitely more potent than all those pyrethrin sprays. Pyrethrins are compounds that come from chrysanthemum flowers and there are synthetic analogs of that as well. So those can work but in a few days or a few weeks all the bugs are back again. I'm hoping that imidacloprid can get rid of my indoor fungus gnat problem because I've been seeing some fungus gnats indoors due to maybe my mango series growing in my closet and also this as well although I'm not too sure so just a little bit of water will thin out this white goop and basically I can pour it in so I wasn't looking forward to doing something like this so soon with a plant growing series but if you have an infestation of bugs you should deal with all of your pots not just one or two. Fungus gnats are a very prolific species and reproduce very quickly as you can see the water dripping down the sides between the crack between the container and the sand has created these uh, dripping patterns in the past. So I'm pouring on the imidacloprid dissolved and I didn't need to get much wet except for that one seedling which it poured directly on and this is displacing all the air within this cylinder mass of soil and sand so there's going to be some shifting around but luckily nothing has fallen over yet so let's see how many do we have here is it uh, 
six or seven seedlings. Uh, we need to get a closer look from different angles later on. I know it's not easy to see everything at this uh, angle. So this thing bubbled for quite a while, and as you can see, let's see, there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, with uh, another one coming out. Um, just barely on the soil line right there so we lost one but um, let's see yeah that's eight seedlings germinated well actually nine and we lost one so that's a great germination rate if you apply the right conditions to everything then they should all prosper although they're gonna start competing in such a small container but for the meantime I'm not really worried as long as we have one or maybe even two or three champions that are healthy. I can eventually transplant this in a container on my balcony. The reason I haven't done so, and I'm just taking my time indoors, is because it's winter time in very early 2019. So it's far too cold and sometimes too rainy, and it would be too cold and wet with very little sunlight received every day outside. Just terrible germination conditions. So I'm going to burn as much time as possible with this plant growing series indoors before perhaps moving out in maybe late February or March. So it's day 31. No more fungus gnats are um, just materializing indoors after I applied all that imidacloprid. So we're in the phase of this growing series where it looks like I can breathe a sigh of relief because everything is growing well and you can see that one seedling that didn't make it and went belly up it got um, misoriented it's just a ball of fuzzy mold so I'll have to remove that just for aesthetic reasons and also to prevent um, a possible mold infection that could spread beyond that although I think the other plant should be safe I think uh, mold really only wants to grow on dead decaying stuff so the soil mass, the sand mass, is much more um, humid and water than it was before, but I think it could use a little bit more. I got rid of the moldy seed on top in between these clips. The sand clay mixture looks like it could use some watering, and I'm using the most gentle watering process I can. I don't want to do the spraying and tip a bunch of things over. This does create a little bit of a disturbance locally at the edge where you can see sort of a depression forming from the force of all that liquid pouring on it. And um, yeah, there's more bubbling, but what can you do? This is not a container with drainage, nor do I really intend to bore little holes at the bottom and start draining. I think this is fine, and I'm willing to let these seedlings grow for maybe even a few more weeks like this, just to see how big they can get. I think this setup will be self-limiting and eventually I'll have healthy seedlings with thick enough stems to safely transplant outside. I gotta think about how far apart I want to move them and what kind of work that would entail. Maybe I'd have to wait until this mass is a little drier and then just put on some gloves and gently peel everything apart. Otherwise if I just sort of cut along the outside of the container and transplant the whole thing in to a, a hole of an equal size in a much bigger pot outside then maybe the competition will be too great or they'll just uh, kind of languish they'll, they'll be fighting with each other for resources and space so I will cross those bridges when I get to there but for the meantime let's just enjoy this growth they're taller than the top of the container now and predictably the ones in the center are doing better it was kind of a depression where I just tapped there. I can smooth that out later with additional pouring or just by using my fingertip. So that's basically it for the first episode of this plant growing series. It's been quite a success with a high germination rate. I would recommend using this method if you're just looking to get started, especially in the winter. It appears that watering by pouring is a more efficient method and the entire mixture is saturated with water now. There are roots encircling the bottom, so like most other fruit tree species, um, pomegranate trees appear to have very deep and extensive roots. So thanks for watching and please stay tuned.